Okay, so let us start. So where are we now? Last time we uh, introduced some associator, which was called Knizhnik Zamolchikov associator. So what was that thing? Some wonderful formula, phi k z. It's a uh, formal power series in two non-commutative variables. It is given by limit epsilon goes to zero of well, what was it? Epsilon minus y, I think. Y. Then there is this holonomy, dx integral from epsilon to one minus epsilon of x over z plus y over z minus one. And, z. and there, there is a regularization on the other side as well. So that was the thing. Now, what does, what does this thing mean? So for example, the coefficient of x, y, y, in the end, it's going to be a form of power series. So that's all as well a form of power series in those two variables. This will come with a number. And what's this coefficient? That coefficient is going to be the integral, the bounds are something like epsilon, z1. There are three things, so there are z1, z2, z3. We stop again at 1 minus epsilon. And okay, the last one to appear is this x, which comes with 1 over z. So there is 1 over z3. Then there is y, which is 1 over z2 minus 1, 1 over z1 minus 1. Okay, so that, that's it. And now the, the final thing that I said, okay, that's a particular example of a, of a word where we have no problem to take the limit. But just we can simply, in this case, we can simply set epsilon equal to zero and here also zero that's going to converge. It's only, see, this regularization, it influences words that start with Y. That regularization, it influences words that start with X, so that end with X. Words that start with X and end with Y, they are safe. There we can take the limit. So for, so words that, that are of the form X, something, 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 Y, one can, one can set directly epsilon equal to zero, and it gives us the coefficient of the associator. So the associator itself, is equal to sum of, oh, sorry, over words in the, those two letters of some coefficients who are in for complex numbers and times the word itself. <coughs> and for these so-called convergent words, we can directly co compute it. And I finish with some theorem that I should, or some calculation that I should finish. So there was a statement that If you have a word that starts with x and ends with, ends with y, it means that if w is equal to, <coughs> there is, how is it called? So it is x km minus one times y up to x k one minus one <coughs> times y. So if you take a word like this, uh, then uh, Well, minus one power m time, times the coefficient of w. That's the sign of the of the coefficient, so I'm going to remove it. So <coughs> this guy is equal to what is called a multi-zeta value, so zeta k1, k2, up to km, who is the sum over, okay, one less than equal than n1, less than n2, less than n m, 
of 1 over n1 power k1, n2 power k2, and m power km. <coughs> so it just says that this integral where we set epsilon equal to zero can be sort of computed. Well, it, become, it can be replaced with its series, which is equally mysterious as this integral. But <coughs> so let's, comp let's prove this thing. And okay, I think that possibly the best way how to prove it is to see a particular example and then I leave it up to you to generalize it. This calculation is it's way better, I think. So for W equal to x, y, x, y. Let's see what happens there. So what is this? Okay, the M is in this case equal to two. So what is this C, x, y, x, y? It's going to be some integral. And let's start from this z z1. So we're starting with, with y. There is one, I should start somewhere safe. One over one minus z1. And we integrate dz over dz1 from zero up to z2. Right. Okay, this is inequality. Then there is something coming from Z2, which is uh, 1 over Z2, an integral from 0 up to Z3, Z2. Then we do something with the Z3. There is a, what is what's happening? There is now Y, so we should use this 1 over 1 minus Z. I'm replacing Z minus 1 with 1 minus Z. That's where this minus comes from. So it's one over one minus z three. <coughs> and we integrate over uh, over z three. We end up uh, up to z four. And finally there is there is x. So I put here one over z four an integral from zero to one. <coughs> so it's this kind of iterated integral, right? That we first integrate this thing, once we find it, integrate that, then we integrate that, then we integrate that. So let's try to compute those integrals. Um, how do I do it? So let's compute it step by step. I'll start with this thing without computing anything. So this thing is equal to Let me call it one, the thing that we're computing. Because there, there are many things. So this one, one thing is, I'll write it as geometric series. And one equal to okay, to zero up to infinity. One power n one. That doesn't start that bad, right? Now we integrate it. So we do we do this integral thingy. So we get two. That that is going to be integral of the thing. So which is take the sum over to this way from n one equal to one to infinity. Z1, n1 over n1. And it's not Z1, it's Z2. It's integral up to Z2. Now, 
let's multiply with this guy and also integrate it. So there's going to be three, uh, two and it uh, here probably, three and here, and I forgot dz4. Okay, so what is three? So we divide it by, by z2 and then, then integrate it. So what happens then? Three is going to be the sum of z, now up to three, so z3 power n1 divided by n1 squared. As you can imagine, right, we just subtract one after dividing and then integrate it back. So we introduce once again this one over n1. And you can imagine we can keep going like that. So if there are more of those one over z, it will only increase the power here. Until one day we meet some, something like this, one over one minus z. So the day has come and let's see Let's see what happens here. So I will not integrate it for the moment. I'll leave it like this, say this four thing. So what is four? That's a, another geometric series there, right? So it's sum over let me call it, I don't know, was there any k? Yes, there was. L. L equal to zero up to, up to infinity of, of the, the three power L times this thing, one, Z three, and one over and one which I can now write in this way, or just multiply those things. And one squared, yes. So what happens now? I can write it as sum over okay, one, n one, and strictly less than n two, n one squared, and there is going to be z three, I'll just add these things up, but since this is strictly equal, strictly greater, then this is going to be more like m n two minus one. Uh, I really want to have this mi minus one because it's going to be integrated right in the next step. So together with this integral, are we here? Yeah, five. <coughs> five is just the integral of that thing up, up to z four. So there's going to be sum one less than equal than n one less than n two of z four power n two over n two or this way n one squared n two. So it's evolving very well. And uh, now the final thing, the entire thingy six. What do we do? just divided by z4, so it just decreases this by one, but we integrate it back, so it will uh, I'll put it back, but we integrate it up to one. So finally, what was it, this was six? Six is equal to sum one less than, less than equal than <coughs> n1 less than n2, one over n1 squared, n2 squared, that's it. That's how it works.
Now we can, so using this calculation, we can write some properties for these multi zeta values. So some properties of those zeta k1 up to km. <coughs> so one thing is, again, I'll show it just as an example. Uh, that when we have, say, zeta 3, that's equal to integral. What, what's happening there? There is 1 over 1 over z3, 1 over, this is what corresponds to x, x, y. 1 over z2, 1 over 1 minus z1, dz1, dz2, dz3, And the one thing that we can do, we can just replace each z with 1 over z. Now, let's try to move each of those zi's into 1 minus zi. So what happens then? Well, this order gets exchanged. That's one thing. And also each of that gets replaced by the corresponding it. So from that, we can see that this is actually equal to integral over less than equal. Okay, let, let me keep the same notation so it will be z3, z2, z1. And now, <coughs> things with. <coughs> Or, okay, let me not put it, could be just the same. <laughs> I think it's saner to, to keep it this way. And, and here we, we would see 1 over z3, 1 over 1 minus z2, 1 over 1 minus <coughs> z1. So this is what would happen. And who is this thing? This thing is simply zeta uh, in my notation. It was what? It was one two. <coughs> so we got this kind of theory identity that zeta three is equal to zeta one two, which was something that was already computed by Euler. Even though strangely enough, he didn't know this integral representation that waited until Konsevich. <laughs> there was this minor gap between Euler and Konsevich. But where, where does it come? Where does it come from? What, what is the meaning for the associator? It's a very simple thing. In, in phi k z, it's a property that we know because we know that any associator, when we uh, replace, <coughs> or what can put it for any associator, we know that. This is equal to phi yx inverse, I think. But uh, okay, computing inverse of a power series is an unpleasant thing, but uh, our phi is group-like. So at the same time, this is the antipode applied on applied on phi yx. So who's the antipode? Antipode is the thing which sends x to minus x and y to minus y and is anti-automorphism of our algebra. So it reverses the, the, uh, the order of, in our case, c, x, y. <coughs> so what does it do? You see, the, this simply says that when you see, say, c, x, x, y, this will contain x. 
<coughs> well, it's not called this word inside as any other word times the coefficient. The coefficient is minus zeta three in this case. And uh, what do we do, do? What do we do? We see here to get the same, same stuff. Probably when we we start with this, will contain C X <coughs> or okay. No, this, this thing will contain something like C X Y Y times now we replace X and Y so it, it means that I should write here Y X X and put S on that and who's, the, who's this who's this guy that guy is just reversing the order and replacing everything with sign so this is minus C x, y, y times uh, x, y, y. <coughs> so that's where we meet, that's where we meet this word in this, uh, in this formal power series. And it will not, it will simply tell us that this thing is equal to this thing. So, so is it x, x, y? Sorry? X, 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 Y, sorry, yes. And so, so, so what's the coefficient here? C, X, Y, Y? Well, the coefficient of, we say we exchange X and Y, mm -hmm. so that's why, but before exchanging X and Y, the coefficient would be X, Y, Y times, times uh, X, Y, Y. <laughs> After exchanging x and y, it's well, still x, y, y, but times y, x, x. Then we apply s, we're looking for. I would just, you see, I, I wrote the thing that will produce this word in the end. How, how do we find this word in this expression? So that word is, uh, is appearing there as s of y, x, x. And the corresponding coefficient there is this c, x, y, y. So in principle, we already we don't need we don't really need to, to know about this property because we already know it. <coughs> now there is an, there is another property. See, if you want to multiply two of those multi-zeta values, we know they're integral expressions, so we can multiply those integrals and we get something. So I don't know, say we have, let me start with the simplest thing, so zeta two is this integral over, so th this is what corresponds to, <coughs> to x, y, and that's going to be this integral one over z one minus z one <coughs> and uh, let me multiply it, I don't know, with itself. To, to keep it as small as, it, as possible. You can do it with, uh, with any of those multi zeta values, but let's try to compute zeta two times <coughs> zeta two. And what do we get? I can write it now in this way. That, so, so the first zeta two is that thing, and the second zeta two is going to be the same thing, but I should call those variables differently. Let, let me call them, like say, w1 and w2 even though W are those words, but let's survive it. <coughs> so we would, you would see there's something like, <coughs> the, 
1 over w1, w2, w2, 1 over 1 minus w2, 1 over <coughs> z2, 1 over 1 minus z1, and there's z1, z2, w1, w2, and we integrated over the product of two triangles. We, we, we integrated with these inequalities, so 0, z1, z2, 1, and 0, w1, w2, 1. But now we can split this uh, region into, uh, into union of over all possible orderings of this z1, z2, and w1, w2. So this one, that region, that will include things like, I don't know, uh, zero less than equal than, so what we know that we have zero, one, there is somewhere there is z1 and z2, and also there is somewhere, somewhere there is w1, and w2, but the mutual position between w's and z's is unknown. So we can choose. For each choice, we would, give an, we would get an ordering. So this will include things like, as it's drawn here, the w1 is less than or equal to z1, less than or equal to w2, less than or equal to z2, and other regions, and other simplices. So for each order, for each mutual order, we can <coughs> we get an integral that we already met. And as a result, this, this thing this implies that this zeta 2 times zeta 2 is a well, z linear <coughs> combination or even z plus linear fusion. combination of those multiple <coughs> zeta values. For, for each ordering that we, that we choose, we will get it. Uh, I, now I do not write it explicitly because we know this property as well. We know it for the associator, we know it as well. Why do we know it? Because we did exercise three, and in exercise three, well, you, I didn't do it, but you proved exactly this property for any associator. So we get in this way, uh, uh, what, what is the corresponding for associators? One simply uses that an associator is defined to be something who is group-like. And that thing implies that when we, when we take the, say, if phi, is equal to that sum of, of some coefficients times some word. That implies that then when you take C, not at all numbers, but, but now some of those words, this can be, this can be expressed in, ter in terms of, as a linear combination of, of, or the, of those coefficients of, the, of this associator explicitly. So this is the, the thing that was in the exercise is that this can be written as C, W1 sha thing, W2, where this thing is defined, where it's a, that's the thing is a linear combination of words, or Z plus linear combination of words, and it's given by all shuffles. It is that one keeps the order in those two words, but now starts to, to plug them in in all possible ways which is sort of difficult to write down, but you have it written down in the exercise sheet. So, all the more reason to do the exercises now. <laughs> okay, so we didn't learn anything new. 
Those are only properties that we already know anyway. But there is one more property which is sort of cute. You know, uh, so far I was using just expression for those zeta values as those integrals. But they are also equal to those series. That's what, that was this theorem that we actually computed that the integral was equal to that series and we call that series it's multi zeta value. And so another property is, again, an example. Say, let's compute who is uh, I don't know, zeta, uh, zeta 3 times zeta 5. So who's this guy? Can we compute it directly? So zeta 3 is the sum and 1 go uh, to 1 to infinity of 1 over and one power three, and the other guy is sum over n two, one over n two power five. And now there are three possibilities. Well, let's say multiply those th those things, and there are now three possibilities. Either n one is smaller than n two, or n one is larger than n two, or n one is equal to n two. There is this wonderful trichotomy. But for each of them, the corresponding sum has a name. So what is when they are actually equal? That part of the sum where they are equal, it's like n1 equal to n2 equal to n. There's going to be like sum of 1 over n power 8, also known as zeta 8. So this is zeta 8 and plus. There is a part where n1 is smaller than n2. So that's zeta 3, 5, plus the same thing when, when the other, when it's the other way around. So, so these are some new relations. These are different from the ones that, were, that can be derived from the integral. And frankly, they're easier to write down. There are, those coefficients are smaller here, that appear here. And now, do we know this thing in term, uh, uh, as a property of the dissociator? Uh, maybe, because there is, strangely enough, this, uh, this thing is a conjecture. Conjecture, so that, that uh, uh, this equality, or this, this kind of equality is obtained from series. This is equivalent to the Pentagon equation. There is no mention of hexagon here because, or, or I can just write that it's Pentagon and hexagon because it is known that Pentagon actually implies hexagon. Even though we don't prove it in this course, but it's somehow true. And yeah, that's the only thing I can tell you that for. To me, it looks like a strange thing that it's a conjecture that either nobody would guess it or once it's guessed, then it should, shouldn't be that difficult to prove. But yeah, apparently it's very difficult to prove. Sorry, yep. What does it mean that pentagon implies hexagon in this case? Uh, the thing is that if you have a if you have this group-like thing which satisfies, uh, satisfies pentagon, and if you, if you look at the coefficient in terms, terms of, in term of uh, sorry, in front of x, y, and call it mu squared divided by 24, okay. which then mu is uh, defined only up to a sign, mm -hmm. then, uh, then this pentagon implies hexagon with, with that mu. That's true and not there, I don't know any enlightening proof of that statement. Okay. Or any reason why it should be true, but yeah, it's just true. Okay, so now we learned everything about those multi zeta values that we didn't want, didn't want to learn.
and some final remarks for this part. So we just, how about some other associators? We constructed one, we're happy to have one associator, but maybe, how about some others? So first of all, there's this wonderful result of Dreamfeld, who says that if there is any associator, if some an associator, some whatever exists in k, x, y, for whatever k. For some some field k of characteristic zero, we know the order that it exists for k equal to c, and then Dreamfeld says that it implies that it, then it exists even for q. That implies phi a exists. Now I can, okay, originally there was a plan that I might be proving that, but we don't have, to, fortunately we don't have time for that. Uh, the thing I can tell you, say an associator is something that satisfies some set of algebraic equations. So already it's very probable that if there is some transcendental solution for those algebraic equations, there should be also some algebraic solutions. Because well, coefficients of, the, of those equations are rational numbers. It's simply written down. What about these pentagon and hexagon equations? They, they are explicit equations, and if you write it down for coefficients of the associator, they are all just algebraic equations with even, okay, with rational numbers. So it's q-bar. Or... But that would be q-bar, but Dreamfeld proved that it's q. Oh. And his wonderful proof was to uh, replace those uh, algebraic equations with uh, linear equations, with rational coefficients. But, uh, well, we probably will not have time to, to, to see how, how to replace it with such a thing, but then it becomes just this nice theorem that if you have a system of linear equations with rational coefficients, and if it has a solution, then it also has a rational solution. That's not nice. Well, application of the theorem. That, uh, okay, so, but, but this thing is uh, not explicit. It's just existence statement. So how about some other explicit So th there is one that one can uh, extract from Konsevich's uh, deformation, quantization thingy, but I mean, the idea is roughly speaking, we, we were using this KZ connection, or maybe I was writing here, I don't remember, which was that sum over of T, T A B, <coughs> and then here there was this D log thing, so D log Z A Z B. That's a nice flat connection. It has so, some drawback that when A comes close to B, there, there is this singularity. When you compute this, uh, that parallel transport, it diverges, and we had to regularize that thing in the definition of the associator. But there is some, some alternative alpha. Where the idea is to write it as T A B. And here I will just write d phi or d arg if you wish. So this is just the angle. So when we have, when those two points collide along a say a straight line, there is now no more any singularity. We we wouldn't have to we wouldn't have to regularize and we wouldn't have to multiply with all kinds of exponential things. The trouble is that this is not a flat connection. 
that these forms are not those wonderful one forms that satisfy those ni nice Arnold relations. These don't. But one can continue. One, one can add here some kind of commutators of, or brackets between T, I don't know, BC times something plus, etc. There is a way how to continue that, continue that thing, and it will give us an explicit associator. Unfortunately, th these coefficients are relatively difficult, but they are still explicit. And this one is, this gives a real, real in the sense that the field is uh, real numbers. And there is a, so let's put here an name Konsevich. I know it doesn't make any sense, but I'm just telling, telling you this nonsense. And the, the fi final thing, which is the most surprising, possibly, that can be ex extracted from Dreamfeld's work, it starts somewhere else. So for that, one would take, <coughs> you would start with an automorphism of algebraic numbers. Uh, which is somehow where on top of that we, we need to see algebraic numbers as part of C. And that uh, sigma is supposed to be reasonably generic, which unfortunately rules out the complex conjugation, which is the only explicit automorphism of, of these algebraic numbers that one has ever seen. But well, we know that all those are that, well, that is an uncountable group. But unfortunately, the only explicit example doesn't work. But it doesn't matter. So such that, such that we also choose some prime p, and this sigma is supposed to be reasonably generic. It satisfies only one simple condition that the p is power of sigma applied to to pi i over p squared should should not be the, the same number. Just for just choose one p, any p. So it's it's enough if it's, if it's not true for one particular p. And probably with this condition, I should say that p is different from two. But actually, the the condition says the condition says so. It has, if you know this silly terminology, but we just says the thing. The p adic. Yeah, such as the periodic cyclotomic character of sigma. So that's somebody who lives in uh, in, in the period in uh, invertible periodic integers is not a root of one. So it's not a finite order. So such a thing, when the sigma specifies a concrete unique, gives us a unique associator who now lives in QP. X and Y. That's a sort of reasonably shocking thing. That's the only reason why I'm telling you this thing. The, the reason why it happens is that there is actually that this absolute Galois group of, of rationals, it acts on, it, uh, it acts on associators with these coefficients, and that's, this is this, uh, its unique fixed point of, it, that's the unique fixed point of the action of sigma. Okay, and 
there are many other things that I could tell you. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, for example, that there is that set of all associators is actually a principal homogeneous space for some group. And that's a very important group, which also tells us that all those associators are related, all of them are sort of the same, or one can pass bet between, between them. So there is something which is called Grotendieck Teich Miller group, let me call it this GRT, which acts on. A, and this action is free and transitive. So these are all kind of things that, that might have been part of this course, except that they are not going to be, because well, we need to wrap it up somewhere. And now, yeah, I should, we should have a break, but just before the break, uh, this is a sort of a turning point in the, in the course that now we are somehow, we're going to wrap it up. We're going to return back, finally quantize those things that we wanted to quantize and conclude at some point. And, the, yeah, and I was, waiting all this time for just for this one wonderful quote, which summarizes perfectly what happened up to now and what's happening, what's going to happen next. So it's a very famous quote for a famous book, which is, the first 10 million years were the worst, said Marvin, and the second 10 million years, they were the worst too. <laughs> the, the third 10 million years, I didn't enjoy at all. After that, I went into a bit of a decline. So we shall now start the decline but after the break. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, let's start. Mm -hmm. it, it really doesn't matter, but the right formula was this one. Because that's, I, I don't want this sigma to, to generate a finite secret group in, uh, when uh, acting on, uh, on roots of unity. And the, the order would be the P minus one and not P, but okay, that's. Let me erase it again. So how about a decline? The first thing we're going to do, we want to go back from braided monoidal categories to non-cumulative algebras. So some definitions might be, first of all, what do I want to do? So a monoid, or I'll just call it an algebra, I mean, that's not a politically correct name, but anyway. Uh, in a monoidal category, C, so what's that? That's an object. Uh, together with a product. So morphism going from A to tensor A to A, and it should also have a unit. There should be a morphism going from the unit object into A, and such that you can guess or not guess you know, such that the, that product is associative. So what can we do? We can take the product here, A tensor A inside, so I don't know if this is M, this is probably like M tensor identity, and then we can take the product to A, or we can re-bracket things, go to A tensor A tensor A, again to A tensor A. So this should commute, and then there should be something with those ones, which is probably something like that. And When we start with so one tensor A, you can go with this inclusion into 
A times zero A, and from there we can take the product. But one times zero A is is already naturally isomorphic to to A, and this should commute, and also the the one which is from uh, from the other side. So okay, that's it. Now one would say, say if if C is actually a braided monoidal category, then A is commutative. Probably the right word would be braided, but people use this commutative thing. If, well, when we, when the product that's going from A tensor A to A, here it is M, then we, when it's the same as when we exchange things, we need to exchange them using braiding. Okay, cool. And, uh, Second thing is now it's a little like a proposition observation. Simple. But in the say usual world, when you, if you have two algebras, then their tensor product is again an algebra, and this observation works in braided monoidal categories, but it doesn't work in monoidal categories. So if now a1, a2, in now what we're in C, our algebras, and this C is a braided monoidal category. So what do we need uh, to define product on, on such a thing? We need to be able to uh, exchange uh, a1 with a2, right? And we can do it if you're in a braid monoidal category. It's an algebra, so what is the new product? It's something like this. A1, A2, A1, A2. And so let's imply, uh, let's apply the braiding, so. So that's the product in A1 tensor A2. And the unit is just the unit. Unit is simply one, it's isomorphic to one tensor one, and that's being sent to A1 tensor A2. There's nothing here. But another observation is, or if you wish, that's a proposition, but it's very, there is nothing to prove. It, you should check that it's associative, but it is associative. Right? You, there, you don't, things don't get entangled. But another observation <coughs> is that if A1 and A2 are commutative, then this thing in general is not going to be commutative. And A1 tensor A2 is in general not not commutative. And what is the best thing? Things get knotted here once you start, once you try exchanging things in this sense, you will, you will soon get into the trouble here. Here it's some more matters whether we can take this under overcrossing or undercrossing, it's our choice. We can choose, we can use either of them. But once we, we pick our choice and we try to, uh, to use a thing like that, we very quickly go to the other choice so things are not going to be equal. 
I'm not going to prove it because there is nothing to prove like, in general with, with the prover, but it's just we're really going to construct non-cumulative things using just this observation. So th this is where non-cumulativity is going to be born. So in some sense, there is a little bit of non-cumulativity in braided monoidal category that it's somehow it's one higher non-commutative, it's somewhere between commutative and non-commutative. But passing to algebras, we moved that non-commutativity down to the level that we know, and that's, that's how it's going to be applied. Now, I'll show you an, an example which doesn't involve any associator yet, but it's uh, But to give some flavor of what, what, what is to come. <coughs> Example. So for that C, I take okay, representations of one dimensional Lie algebra. Right. Representations of, of R. It means that the objects here are really just uh, like vector space and, uh, and an endomorphism. That's how this one in R acts here. Uh, okay, so what is the tensor product here? Just uh, so this guy is going to be braided monoidal category. We saw that braided monoidal category in some, uh, in some exercise, I think. So uh, what is the, in tensor product there is, there is no, nothing strange. So V and TV tensor W, TW is just V tensor W. This guy, now on uh, the tensor product of, of two linear maps is just the tensor product of two linear maps. And there is nothing, nothing I should write here. The, yep, okay. The, the, we only take those linear maps that com commute with those t's, but that, that's, I hope, like, it's part of the definition here. The only strange thing is that uh, we introduce some new braiding, so we wouldn't use this would normally be a symmetric monoidal category, or we make it to a braided monoidal category. The braiding, the braiding is what? Is beta dW. That's just the symmetry. You just replace, exchange those things. But then to recompose it with exponential. And since now my vector spaces are not necessarily finite dimensional, I put here this h bar to make it convergent, formally convergent, the thing, and tv tensor tw. That's a relatively simple braided monoidal category. Then later on, we're going to use something similar, but for a non, uh, non commutative. Lie algebra, and then uh, we need to use some associators to make it work. Here, at, for this abelian thingy, we don't need any, any associator, we can just stay like that. Now, let me take who is going to be A1. For A1, I'll, I will take functions on a line, say C infinity functions. Uh, but who's going to be T? T is going to be just derivative, so I don't know, d over dx, where x is the coordinate here. Is it an algebra here? Is it an algebra in this category? Yes. It is an algebra in this category, exactly because this is a derivative. This is a derivation of our algebra. That's what it, so the, the question is whether
where the ordi where the ordinary product we, we just take we just keep the ordinary product on C infinity of M. It's certainly an associative product. <coughs> <coughs> The only question is whether this is a morphism. Is it a morphism? That's precisely the statement that this is a derivation of our algebra. Why is that? Because T here is defined by applying it either here or there and some of those. That's, that's the definition. OK. It's an algebra. What do I take for A2? I take the same thing. But just to distinguish the uh, A1 from A2, I will call the coordinate on the second on the second R by Y. So it's going to be <coughs> okay. And let's now compute what what this stuff gives. Raise it. So we want to now deal with A1 turns to A2. And let me cheat a little bit out right here, this completed tensor product, even though it's not really a tensor product in our category, but Let's modify the category so that it becomes the tensor product or something. So, because I want it to be C infinity on, on R2, where this R2 now has coordinates X and Y. That's why I wanted to distinguish those two things. Why so there? X and Y. And now there was this uh, nice diagram. Okay, that's it. Like this. So let us take two functions, fxy and gxy. So what do I have to do to, to compute this kind of product? So I'll start with an f here, then I'll start with g. f belongs to that tensor product, g belongs to, again, to this tensor product. What do I need to do? I need to exchange the, the y component of, of f with x component of, of g. And then I need to take the product. So in the end, what it gives, f s star g. What you will get is there is this braiding thing, which is exponential h bar, I'm going to differentiate on, on the left by, by y, I said, right? Because I'm exchanging y with x. And here, the x, like that. And then I write here g, x, y, and here f, x, y. See, if I, if I didn't take the product, if I, if I cut it here, then I would need to keep like x1, x1, y1, and x2, y2. But taking the product simply means that I put x1 equal to x2 equal to x, and y1 equal to y2 equal to y. So this is really the product. I, I, I'm, maybe I can let, let you think about it. Why, why the product given by this is really given by that? That's an associative product. It's a deformation of the ordinary product. It's not quite the Moyal product that we saw because it's not quite, not so nicely symmetric be between X and Y, but it's a, it's a star product. Wait. Quantizing the uh, relation, what, what, do, what do we have here? Probably, if I if I write something like y y star x, then I get 
y x or x y doesn't matter, x y plus one, x star y is simply x y. So, uh, or sorry, it's h bar here. And so the corresponding Poisson bracket is y y x is equal to one. So just, the com just the, this constant Poisson bracket can be quantized in this silly way. And we're simply going to generalize a little bit this stuff and put associators on top of that and it will work. Uh, I have to say, I'm a little bit cheating here. I mean, everything is correct, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit cheating all the time. But there is something that might, might seem to be implied somewhere. Because I said that the trick is that in a braided monoidal category, when you take two commutative algebras and you take their tensor product, it might perhaps be something non-commutative, and that's how we're going to introduce non-commutativity. This is not what happened here because this algebra in that category is already non-commutative. Sounds maybe strange, but you know uh, the definition of commutativity was something like that this is equal to that. And that's not true. Here you can verify it that it's not true, but one can uh, say, one can easily correct it, in fact, in what we would be doing next. Uh, the only thing that one needs to correct is replace this R by R2. It would be two-dimensional Lie algebra acting here, and uh, on the first C infinite, there, there would be only the first R acting, on the second C infinite, there would be only the second R acting, and then it, then it would be a true example. But just an example of how to compute those products, and that, in particular, that this Moyalish thing, this exponential of derivative and derivative, that's going to stay there all, all the time, and it simply comes from this one single braiding. That we're going to have there all the time, but we might get there some associators when you try to re-bracket things to put two things to get close together to, to exchange them, and things like that. Okay. Now. So some wonderful abstract terminology that should have been there from the very start of this course, probably, but I won't try to avoid it, uh, which made it um, unnecessarily difficult. So the thi uh, thing we're going to talk about are uh, monoidal functors. So what is a so definition? Uh, the monoidal, or let's call it strongly, possibly, okay, strongly monoidal. Functor f from c1 to c2 where C1 and C2 are monoidal categories. So what is it? Well, it's a functor. But we want it to be somehow compatible or playing nicely with, with monoidal structures, so it needs to come together. with some natural natural transformations. So who are they in which in which direction? So we want to go from Fx Fy Fxy, and also we want to to preserve the unit somehow. And what is the right direction? So I never know. Okay, so 
this is natural transformation. This is just a uh, this is just a morphism, but I should say uh, where it's happening. This guy is in C1, and that's in C2. And we satisfy something, so for sure. This tells us that we, we're able to bracketing in, in the image is the sort of the same as bracketing in before the sense sending it, but then it should satisfy some relation. It should satisfy a sort of obvious relation such that. So what can we, what can we do? We can start re-bracketing things. I didn't write it down. Okay, never mind. Fx, Fy. Fz, what can we do? We can go here to Fx, Fy, Fz, like that. So that's what, that this is what is happening in C2. And then we can try to move it all into C1. So how do, how do we move it? This is going to be isomorphic to f, x, y, f, z, and then in turn it's isomorphic to f of x, y, z, and here the same thing, f, x, f, y, z, f, x, y, z, So this is somehow rebracketing in C2, and this is f of rebracketing in C1. And we want this to commute, so, so such that this commutes. And the similar thing for the unit. So did I write what's? Yeah, just the comments with rebracketing and also a similar, similar thing. So the idea of this definition is simply that we have some structure in C1, some structure in C2, and we want these two structures to be compatible. The only, the only structure that we have here is this. Product of two of two objects. So we, we want to have a natural isomorphism, and we want this natural isomorphism to commute with operations that we have there. That, that's the only thing. And okay, that's the definition. Now there is a little modification of that. So F is weakly. Let me use maybe some color. if those those morphisms if this thing is not required to be an isomorphism and likewise for this one two are not necessarily isomorphisms, or sometimes people, people say that it's lax, monoidal. And the final thing that we might possibly need, uh, once it's not an isomorphism, then we can, we can try to choose. Either we go in this direction or the opposite direction, and there is a name also for the opposite direction. And so F is either comonoidal, or wonderf really wonderful name, Oplex.
if those arrows go, go the other way. Just, you can call it weekly commonoidal. But I guess the idea is that commonoidal is already bad enough, so one doesn't need to add weekly. X, Y, and also one goes the other way. Is there also something called collect? There might be something called collect. Okay, so now, now we see why I didn't introduce this terminology before. <laughs> but it's, oh, okay, it's just a lot of words, but it simply says that it's a functor which is compatible with monoidal structure. There is nothing else to it. And some examples with that we already <coughs> saw. So there is this overloaded one. I'm going to use it also as a category. So, so it's just notation is that at least sometimes uh, that one as a monoidal monoidal category is going to be category with where the only object of one is one. <laughs> That's not itself, but <laughs> it's one of this category and whatever the home from one to one is contains only one one morphism that I will, might be called one. <laughs> it's just identity. And whatever one tensor one is is equal to one. It's just it's kind of trivial monoidal category. Then a say weekly monoidal functor going from this one into C. That's some monoidal category. So what is that? Well, this contains a single object. So to understand the functor and also a single morphism, so there is not nothing to know about the morphism. This functor is fully uh, specified by, by knowing who is F1. But then we, would, uh, we need to make it to, to a monoidal functor, so it should come with something okay, that there should be morphism going from F1 tensor F1 into F of 1 tensor 1, who is 1. And it should be associative. And plus, there should be a morphism going from one, it's not that one, it's the one in C, uh, into F1. So what is this guy? It's an associative algebra, an algebra. Okay. So the, the thing is the same as an algebra in C. Now, how about the commonoidal? From one to C. That's a thing that we didn't see, but it's called a co-algebra. It's the same. Co-algebra in, in C. Why is that? Because now we want, like it's again specified by F of one, but now the arrow goes the other way, right? So now, now we go from F1 to F1 tensor F1, and likewise, we go from F1 to 1 here. And it's what is called algebra, it's an algebra just upside down. Okay, what else for this horrible terminology?
One more thing is probably uh, when we talk about braided monoidal categories. So far, they were just monoidal categories, but in braided monoidal categories, we might uh, demand that functor to preserve also braiding. So, this, say, a call monoidal functor f from c1 to c2, where now c1 and c2 are braided. Is braided if it commutes with braiding. If, well, what, what commutes with braiding? Well, there is a fx. Fy, you can ap apply braiding here. Get to Fy Fx. But from here, we, we get to F of Xy. Here we get to F of Yx. The morphism here is just F applied to the braiding between <coughs> X and Y. Well, if this commits. And co would just mean that there's this co direction when, when this commits. Mm -hmm. Now, again, an example. Well, that, that category one is also a braided monoidal category. Just everything, because there is nothing in, in, in it. There is it's a unique object, unique morphism. Everything is defined. So one is also a braided monoidal category. And now if you have, if so C is another, and F going from one into C is a braided, say weekly, monon, monoid of functor. So what's, what is such a thing? I think you can guess. It's nothing but a commutative algebra. So that's equivalent with f of 1 is a commutative algebra. That's precisely what this thing says. That, that we can exchange f1 with f1 and take the product. And it's the same thing as if we don't exchange it, because the, the braiding in 1 is the trivial. There is not, because there is no, morphi no other morphism than, than the identity. And similarly, for uh, if it's a braid, commonality of functor is going to be a uh, co-commutative co-algebra. Now there is a, I may call it a proposition, but it should be part of the general story, just that, that when we take two monoidal functors and compose them, that we get naturally a monoidal functor. And when we take two braided commonoidal functors and compose them, then the result is a braided commonoidal functor. So I'll just write that the composition. Say if. F1, okay, C1, F1, C2, F2, C3, F2 are of some type, like, like weekly, monoidal, or I don't know, braided. Commonoidal, etc. Then their composition F2, F1 is again of the same type.
So from, from there, it's again sort of example. If you imagine that you start with one, now apply a functor going to C1, and apply a functor going to C2. Uh, let me call it now F. Or it's not called Z. This was called F. So if, uh, if F is, say, weakly monoidal, if G is weakly monoidal, then we can compose them. If FG are weakly monoidal, meaning that the first one, F1, is an algebra. One and their composition is a is again a weakly monoidal functor. That implies that that G of this F one is an algebra in C two. So weakly monoidal functors will send algebras to algebras for this stupid abstract reason that composition of two weakly monoidal functors is a weakly monoidal functor. Or it, it's sort of even possibly easier to prove it directly. If you want to recall what, what is actually the definition of a weakly monoidal functor, this is what characterizes it. Uh, but the, the only difficult part is to remember the, the direction of those arrows. And that, that's a way how to, how to recall it if you wish. So what is happening? You see now, say if you have a commutative algebra and and now compose it with some braided monoidal functor, the outcome is going to be a commutative algebra. But if you have even, say, a commutative algebra, but send it somewhere with simply a monoidal functor, somebody who doesn't preserve braiding, then the outcome is perhaps no longer a commutative algebra. And that's, again, just rewarding of how we're going to find non-commutativity. That we start with a commutative algebra, apply to it some Functor who is monoidal but not braided monoidal, and the outcome is going to be non commutative. And so, this example so, so if we see is a braided monoidal category. Then also C times C is a braided monoidal category. Or any, any, anything times anything is going to be anything at the same time. So then C times C, times C is also braided monoidal category. Just those th things don't talk to each other. So it's, definition should be obvious. Uh, and we have a natural functor going from C, C times C to C. Who's that natural functor? It's the tensor product. So the functor C times C to C, that thing, is monoidal or is strongly And I should say what it, I should now define its monoidal structure. So we should de define how to, ex how, what, what it means. <clears throat> so what does strongly monoidal mean? Let me remind it here. We should, we should go from Fx, Fy to Fxy. But now this x is somebody who is from here, so it's a pair of objects. And that Y is again a pair of objects. 
And so what, what it should be, so we should say we have x1, x2, and y1, y2. So two, two objects in, in C, in C times C. So we should go from fx is something like x1, x2, and then tensor width. Tensor with y1, y2, and we should go to where? Now, this is tensor product in C times C. What is tensor product of C times C? There is x1, x2, tensor product with y1, y2. It's just product here and the product there. Right? So it's x1, x1, x2, sorry, x1. Y1, comma, uh, X2, Y2. So in the end, we should go to X1, Y1, X2, Y2. And how do we do it? There is, okay, this looks horribly abstract, but there is only one reasonable way how to do it, and you can forget all, all those serial letters. There is only one thing one can do, and it's this. So this is x1, x2, y1, y2, and this is going to be x1, y1, uh, x2, y2. That's our isomorphism. That's a mono strongly monoidal fu functor. Okay. But it is, uh, in general, not braided. So this functor, when we apply it to commutative algebra, will no longer be a commutative algebra. And we already saw that example, so we applied so this is what gives the diagram that we had there before. So this is what we'll send, this is how we, we're going to send a pair of possibly cumulative algebras, one in C, the other one again in C, into an, again an algebra, so we start with an algebra here, we get an algebra there, and the way we get it is that it has this product. So it's just a reformulation of the stuff. And so let me finish this decline for today. <laughs>